There we go. Okay. So we remember from yesterday, right? That obviously all these all these loads in the brain have different jobs, they do different things, right? But today we're going to get a little bit more granular and detailed, right? In regards to not only maybe some of the function, but how a lot of that actually works together. Um, we're going to get into a little bit more detail. Um, in regards to the function of both the pre and post central gyrus, right? And how that affects not only sensory function, but motor function. And then we're gonna talk about some spinal tracts and essentially their, their application to disease, right? Based on the level uh, where the lesion, is, or the, lesion, the lesion is taking place, all right? Okay, friends. So we remember, right, frontal lobe, okay, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, by the way, who can tell me, okay, who can tell me what, what does the temporal lobe do? What, what's its main function? Isn't it auditory? Okay, yeah, in the sense of actually, you know, auditory and visual recognition and, and memory, yes. Absolutely, okay. All right, so, okay. Obviously, uh, parietal lobe back here, occipital lobe, which controls what? Occipital lobe. Vision. Uh, vision, yeah, who said that? Sorry, I can't see all your faces. It was Brianna. Hey, yes, awesome. Okay, cool. All right, friends, so here's the deal. We have broken uh, broken this down for you actually in lobe by lobe uh, and uh, given you essentially the function, right, of each of the major lobes. Um, you can see here, obviously, so we've got frontal lobe here, obviously executive planning. Uh, this is the, the lobe of my brain that goes haywire seven days a week, um, right? We have the temporal lobe, obviously, uh, you know, so sensory interpretation, visual and auditory memory, okay? The parietal lobe, okay, which is where we actually comprehend speech and, and produce language. Now, here in a minute, you guys are going to learn about a structure um, that essentially has, uh, you know, the, we're going to go over structures that, act, that essentially have two parts. So the presensual and postcentral gyri. Um, and how they actually contribute to both motor and sensory function. And ultimately what we're gonna see is that there are different, um, there are actually different areas of these uh, pre and post central gyri that actually do and control specific uh, areas of our, of our body, both sensory and motor function, right? Uh, obviously we know cerebellum uh, balanced and high level coordinated movements. Now here's the deal. Um, and that's it's something that I forgot to add here, but we can, I'll give it to you. We can write it down. Um, so we have actually within the motor cortex and the sensory cortex of the pre and post central gyrus. So the, the motor cortex um, controls obviously voluntary movement, right? And the sensory cortex um, obviously controls sensory interpretation, okay? So let's go back to this slide for a second. All right, what I'm gonna do here is we're gonna do a little bit of, a little bit of artwork, a little bit of drawing. All right. Now, what you're going to see here is we have this big, we have this big, okay. now, on the front, on the anterior aspect of this sulcus, right, lives this, this strip right here. I'm going to get another color, and I'm going to attempt to kind of highlight that in a different color if I can. Uh, What? Oh, okay, sweet. Okay, so here we go. And we have this little strip of frame space, right? And this right here is the pre-central gyrus, right? Right here that I'm coloring green. Man, it's kind of fun. Um, all right, now this actually controls a lot of my motor function, okay? Right on the anterior aspect of this gyrus, okay? However, conversely, on the other side, posterior to that central, to that, to that sulcus, I have my post-central gyrus, okay? This is gonna control a lot of my sensory function, all right? Okay, so just a little bit of a, a, little bit of a primer there because that's really gonna help uh, over these next uh, couple slides. Okay, does that make sense though, no questions? Okay. All right, 
Check it out. Who remembers this nightmarish picture from AMP? Yeah. All right. So essentially what this is telling us, if we break, if we break these gyri down, right, into both their motor and their sensory components, all right, what it's essentially going to tell us is that there are different areas of the of the pre and post central gyrus. So the, the motor cortex, the, the motor cortex and the sensory cortex that regulate the motor function of different areas, right? Uh, from me, from essentially lateral to medial, right? So when I say lateral, uh, towards the temporal lobe, moving medially, right? Towards the middle of the brain, okay? And then the sensory strip, okay? Moving laterally from the temporal lobe, medially, okay? To the central sulcus or the center of the brain between the, the left and right hemisphere of the brain, okay? So ultimately that, uh, that, it, that I, for me, that actually helps explain the homunculus a lot better as far as what it actually does, right? Have you guys, did you guys ever, I mean, honestly, and, and maybe you did, maybe you were just, you were, you did, you did that well, but um, did any of you guys ever like, just look at this and have no idea what you were staring at in AMP, or was it just generally pretty comprehensible? Okay, okay. All right, all right, here's the deal. Now we're going to get into some things that are maybe a little bit, a little bit more complicated, but um, the these are really important for us to know nonetheless. All right. So on a very basic level, right, there are pathways um, that sensory information takes, right, from the periphery up to the brain and back down, right. And those and those those pathways are called spinal tracks, right. Um, so essentially, there there's essentially one motor track uh, that we're going to talk about and two. Uh, sensory tracks that we're going to talk about. Excuse me. Um, so ultimately, they take information obviously from the periphery, uh, and that afferent signal travels right um, up the neuron to the spinal cord, and then uh, synapses with the uh, upper motor neuron, right, and then sends that signal up to the brain. Um, okay. So the corticospinal tract. Okay. If you if you hear or you or you see corticospinal, you need to automatically think motor. Okay, the corticospinal tract governs all motor activity for the brain. Okay, that is the tract um, that uh, motor input travels uh, travels on, right, uh, to the motor cortex <laughs> where, where, where where voluntary movement is produced. <laughs> um, so corticospinal tract motor. Okay, then. We've got two somatosensory tracts, right? We have the spinothalamic tract, okay? And then we have the dorsal column, uh, medial, medial uh, lemniscus system. And you can just say the dorsal column and you don't have to, anyway, so, because we'll know what you're talking about. All right, so the spinothalamic tract, <laughs> I'm sorry. The spinothalamic tract, um, Ugh. essentially transmits, right, uh, thing like sensations like pressure, you know, heat, cold, temperature, those types of things are transmitted along the spinal, the spinal thalamic tract. And then you have the dorsal uh, medial lemniscular system in, in the dorsal column that actually transmits sensory information uh, for interpretation. And so we're going to look at these pictures actually and kind of discuss this. I know I kind of ran through that, but okay. So here we go. This is actually the the corticospinal tract. Okay. Now, here's the deal. The one thing that you notice if you look at this, all right, is ultimately that you have an area, okay, where this where this tract does what we call decussate. Okay, it decussates or crosses. All right. And you'll notice here that it decrosses or that it decussates or crosses, right? Right around the level of the medulla. <laughs> And travels, um, obviously, up through the ponds in the brain, <laughs> um, and oh crap, uh, into the ponds in the brain, right, and then into the motor cortex. Now, the one thing about this is it actually this actually crosses um, at a lower level, okay, than our, than our sensory tracks. Um, but remember. Right. This is this is the, the, the physiologic reason why with stroke, 
with other pathologies, someone can have like a left sided or, a, you know, a stroke that affects the left hemisphere of the brain that shuts down their right sided motor function. Okay. Does that make sense? This is the reason for that. Okay. Because that tract crosses from the, we're going to say the right side here over to the left side at the level of the medulla and decussates, right? And so that's the reason why we, how we can have motor changes to the opposite side, right? And I think about like my grandma, for example, when I was a kid, I had a stroke and she had a, essentially a damage to her left uh, cerebral hemisphere that affected her ability to essentially not only feel, but utilize the, the entire right side of her body. She was paralyzed on the right side, right? Um, and so physiologically, the setup of this tract is why those presentations occur. Does that make sense? Okay, all right, conversely, okay, conversely, we have, uh, so the, <coughs> the dorsal column, <coughs> so ultimately what we see here is that this is that the, the dorsal column actually decussates or also crosses, but it does so actually at a lower level, okay? This is our primary, one of our primary sensory pathways, all right? And what it actually does is this pathway actually helps us interpret information, interpret sensory information. So uh, remember how last semester we learned st um, stereognosis? You guys remember that? Okay, who can tell me, who remembers, okay, who remembers what stereognosis was? Just in, you know, just just throw just throw it out there if you remember. It doesn't even have to be completely and totally correct. That's why we're here. So, was was that the um, where we did like the touching sensations and being able to like your eyes closed eyes closed? Yeah. So yeah, Josh. So ultimately, we put so we have the patient obviously close their eyes and we put an object in their hand, right? And we have them tell us based on what they're feeling, what that object is, all right? And you guys did that with me in class. So you guys gave me different objects that I had to essentially hold and identify, right? Based on their shape, right? So that is stereognosis. Now, ultimately, okay, it's my, it's my, my column that actually allows me to do that, right? That's the, that's the track that allows me to make those decisions about what it is that I'm feeling, okay? So that is where I interpret that information. Does that make sense? All right. If there's any questions, you guys stop me, okay? All right. So, the, okay, here's our, our second sensory pathway. All right. Um, so this is the uh, spinothalamic tract. And what this is gonna do for us is this is actually gonna help us uh, sense changes in pressure and temperature. All right, so like, for example, when I burned my face yesterday on my coffee, right? That sensory information traveled in a very short order, right, up my spinothalamic tract, right? And I interpreted the fact that my face was hot, right, and that I was uncomfortable, right? And I quickly, right, realized what was happening. So ultimately, now here's the difference, guys. If you look at this, actually, look at that because you guys have had modalities too. So this is actually really applicable to you. Look at the fibers. Look at the fibers here um, on this pathway. Okay, who can tell me, so what two fibers do we have listed here? A delta and C. Okay, what do you remember about A delta and C? A delta is faster, so it like clogs up the channel, I guess, and blocks the C fibers. Okay, all right, and okay. And that's actually gate control, so because we can only have one stimulus pass through the door so one at a time, right? So. And then that's you tell what me I about meant to C. say, I just didn't say oh. it right. No, you're good. No, that, I, I like it. So who, what can you tell me about C-fibers? They're unmyelinated, so the stimulus moves slower. Yeah, yeah. And ultimately, too, with our C-fibers, generally speaking, which fibers are typically more active during a pain response? Isn't that C fibers? Because that's the whole pain inhibits pain theory, right? Right. Yes. C fibers are typically more active during a pain response. 
Okay. So ultimately, right, these fibers um, obviously travel to the, uh, you know, from the uh, travel to the uh, posterior horn of the spinal cord and obviously up the spinothalamic tract, okay, where they're interpreted and um, are sent back down, obviously, via the efferent pathway um, out to our sensory fibers, okay? So all of this, guys, has a point, okay? Knowing this is going to help us. It's going to help us actually determine, right, and learn what thing is going to help us determine what type of pathology someone has, okay? This is going to help us learn the difference, the key difference between an upper motor and a, and a lower motor neuron region, okay? Um, and so, um, sorry. So um, in about a week, when we start doing like examination of reflexes and tone, you guys, your, your minds are gonna blow, right? So we have, um, so I was actually born with an upper motor neuron region, right? I've had it my entire life. And so you guys are gonna get to feel on me some really increased tone. You're gonna get to feel abnormal reflexes and a positive Babinski on me, which is gonna, yeah. And so we'll explain all of that when we get there. But ultimately, um, because, because of the way that I am physiologically uh, kind of set up, right? Um, what you're gonna see is that everything below the level um, of that lesion is affected. So I'm gonna have things like clonus, increased tone, and we're gonna learn all about that. It's gonna be super fun. Um, so an upper motor neuron lesion, okay, is any lesion, any lesion that takes place above the level where the spot, where essentially where the spinal tract intercepts with the inner neuron body in the horn of the, in the horn of the spinal cord. So if we remember where our gray matter lives in the spinal cord, it lives in the horn, okay, in the anterior posterior horn. And any, so any lesion that takes place prior to that junction, does this make sense? Is an upper motor neuron lesion, okay? So if I, for example, if I have a lesion, you know, in my cerebrum, okay, up here, that is an upper motor neuron lesion because the lesion exists higher than or at a level higher than the junction of the spinal tract to the spinal cord. Okay, does that make sense? However, however, if the lesion itself takes place at the level of essentially the, the peripheral nerve, that is a lower motor neuron lesion. Okay, so it's below the level of synapse between the spinal tract and the cell body in the spinal cord. That is a lower motor neuron lesion. Okay, so that's the key difference. So how do we put that into practice clinically? Okay, how do we take that and how do we, how do we make sense of it? Okay, so for example, um, I'll give you guys a case that one of, when I was practicing, what, that what happened to one of my assistants. So we were at a football game and she was, she was behind the line and one of the cheerleaders fell, got, fell off the top of a pyramid and, and, and hit her head. She fell from about maybe 15, yeah, I would say probably 10, 15 feet. I didn't see it, I was watching the field. And, and as soon as this young lady hit the ground, okay, she hit the ground within a matter of maybe a few seconds, started seizing, all right? So yeah, she started seizing. So we take, she gets automatically, we get her boarded. She goes to the hospital. Um, she had a bleed, right? She had, she had a brain bleed. Um, and because she had a brain bleed, she was actually, she actually had bilateral symptoms. Uh, she had, a, she had essentially temporary clonus. She had a positive Babinski, right? And those things actually resolved with time. She got better. Now, because of where the dysfunction was, okay, she was displaying symptoms of an upper motor neuron lesion. Does that make sense? because the pathology actually took place here, not in the periphery, okay? Yeah, Josh is shaking his head, light bulb, okay, yes. And we're, we're gonna talk more about this in a second. We'll expand on this and we're gonna help, this is gonna make sense, okay? As opposed to, for example, as opposed to someone that comes in to see you, maybe they have, let's say they have an L5S1 radiculopathy, Okay, and they have nerve root compression at that level. 
okay? So ultimately, the lesion is at the peripheral nerve. There, there is a disc that is essentially herniating and touching the peripheral nerve, all right? And so they have numbness tingling in the L5-S1 distribution. They've got weakness of the great toe, right? And weakness with ankle eversion, those types of things, right? That is a lower motor neuron lesion, okay? Because it occurs below the level of the spinal cord in the periphery, yeah? Okay, now let's get into a little bit more, a little bit more detail here um, and kind of talk about some things clinically as, as far as what you're gonna see. Okay, check it out. And the, here's the deal. These are key terms, guys, that you've gotta know. We gotta get these down because this is gonna not only, right? Not only is this gonna this, this is this is gonna help you, it's gonna make you look super smart. And you're gonna and, and, and you're gonna help people and potentially potentially save somebody's life. Okay. So radiculopathy. What in the world is radiculopathy? Okay. Radiculopathy is pathology affecting a peripheral nerve root. Okay, so a nerve root. Okay. Now that can be either traumatic. Okay, like in the case of <coughs> like in the case of a stinger, right, or like a brachioplexopathy, right? That's traumatic. They may have weakness of weakness with thumb extension. Okay, at C seven. Okay, that's a traumatic C seven radiculopathy. Now, obviously, with a brachioplexopathy, we don't see those, you know, really being that isolated, generally to one level, right? Um, but those can be traumatic. Okay, a radiculopathy can be compressive. What do I mean by compressive? Okay, what if there is inflammation around one of the facet joints in the spine? And it's so incredibly, and I'll draw, I'll draw a picture because that's always helpful. Okay, let me draw a picture because that always helps. All right, I'm gonna draw this out for you guys because I feel like this is it's more helpful this way. Um, Okay. Oh, we're, we're, we're on time. That's fantastic. It's 11.03. Love it. Okay. So for example, okay, what in the world, wait, are you talking about? So you're talking about this compressive neuropathy, right? So let's say, for example, I've got a vertebrae here. Okay. Here's my, here's my disc. Whoa. This is really badly drawn and I apologize. Okay. Another vertebrae here. Whoa. Here's my nerve. like that. Okay. However, all right, I have a disc herniation. So that disc actually, you know, I get a little bit of tearing in the, in the annulus fibrosis of my disc. This disc then herniates out. And what happens here is I then start to have compression on a nerve root. So I'm impinging on that peripheral nerve. Okay. That is a compressive radiculopathy. Radiculo means nerve root. Right? Is this making sense or am I just like, yeah, it is? Okay. If it's not, stop me. All right. So that is a compressive radiculopathy. Okay. So we can also have, for example, we can have a, uh, a radiculopathy of insidious onset. Okay. What's an example of maybe a radiculopathy uh, that can be something that's insidious that you guys might have covered in Gen Med? What's an example of it? I don't know if we covered this in gen med, but I mean, in theory, carpal tunnel could be insidious because it just kind of happened. I mean, yes, there's a cause, but to the person, it's just started showing up, you know? Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, definitely. And particularly if they can't describe, uh, ascribe, sorry, there's people like sticking signs in my yard. I don't know what the hell they're doing, but they're just like literally walking around sticking signs in my, oh, okay, sorry, sidebar. So I like, you guys can't see this, but right across from my house, actually this weekend, that's this weekend, they're having basically this giant hot air balloon festival. So they're literally going to be like, like on this football field that I can see from my living room window. They're going to be like sending off like hundreds of like hot air balloons this weekend. And so there are people sticking no parking signs in my yard. Okay, never mind. Sorry, I'm done with that. Moving on. Um, I was confused for a second. Okay, so yes, Bella particularly if that person doesn't have like, you know, essentially something that they could describe as essentially a mechanism of injury, right? That could definitely be one. 
what's another that could potentially be uh, that could potentially be um, insidious? Maybe insidious onset. What's another one that uh, this is something that our, 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 our patients that are typically more elderly typically have to get vaccinated for, usually. Who knows? Is it what shingles? Can, yeah, shingles. Very good. Shingles, very painful. No good, right? It hurts really bad, right? So it's very important, obviously. Shingles can be, obviously, it can cause, um, you know, a radiculopathy and or a neuropathy uh, that can be insidious and onset. Okay, last one. Iatrogenic. Okay, iatrogenic. What is iatrogenic? First of all, what does iatrogenic mean? It means that it was caused by um, like treatment. So it could be like surgical or if it, they were taking a drug that caused the side effect. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So caused by a healthcare provider and or medication. Absolutely, Maddie, fantastic. Yes, okay. Um, so, you know, one, uh, yeah. It's really interesting. So uh, one of the main complaints, I'm sure you guys know by now, if you have people, right, and this happens generally with every knee surgery, how many of you guys have ever had like a student athlete or a patient ask you this question after they've had knee surgery? Why is my knee numb, right? Have you guys heard them say that? Like, why is my knee numb right here? Okay. Now, that is an iatrogenic cause of nerve injury in order to make the incision, right, to access the joint. Um, either through an, an arthroscopy portal, excuse me, or for, for like a total knee replacement, um, they have to essentially make an incision into the skin, right? And they will end up obviously cutting a very small nerve endings there, right? And those may or may not regenerate, right? And so that is that is that is very simply put, an, an iatrogenic complication uh, to that type of a procedure. Okay, is it really harmful for the patient in the long run? No, not entirely. <laughs> uh, there are obviously other uh, situations in which that can be a lot debilitating. Um, so, and one thing that, one thing too, that, oh yeah, that's, that's bad. One thing that we uh, sometimes see, so an iatrogenic complication also of spinal injections has happened with a patient, not that I was directly treating, but uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, patient got referred over for um, an epidural steroid injection. And uh, the physician that was performing the procedure, unfortunately, uh, when he was uh, essentially inserting the needle into the, uh, into the foramen, uh, essentially hit it, it basically hit an artery uh, inside of the dura and punctured it and caused a bleed. And the guy essentially had a spontaneous brain bleed and, and then a heart attack. So that was fantastic. Um, so that, that's another example of an iatrogenic complication. Okay. So, all right. Anyway, back to the PowerPoint. Was that my whiteboard? Oh, poop. Where did it go? Okay. Yep. You guys can see that? Okay, so obviously the, the, the point here being for you guys, as far as thinking about what's wrong with this person, what could this be, right? So generally speaking, radiculopathy, okay, is usually going to be a unilateral presentation because this is, a, this is a involvement of a peripheral nerve, okay? The symptoms that they are describing to you will generally be one-sided, will be unilateral, okay? because it's peripheral, as opposed to myelopathy, okay? Myelopathy is obviously a pathology affecting the spinal cord, okay? That can be traumatic. Someone can have a spinal cord injury and be paralyzed, okay? It can be compressive. I can have a, a huge disc herniation that's, that's protruding centrally and putting pressure directly on the spinal cord, all right? It can be insidious, obviously, or adrogenic. Uh, and so that's a central pathology. And that presentation is usually bilateral. Okay, here's my question for you guys. And I want, I want us to talk about this for a second because this is absolutely vital in your understanding of these pathologies and being able to triage, to triage your patients. Who can tell me, and I want you to explain to me 
in business. Okay. Why would something that is ridiculous be unilateral and something that's myelopathic be bilateral? Explain it. If, if this makes sense to you, I want you to explain to me why it makes sense. Because knowing this difference and being able to pick it up is key. Is it because the myelopathy ones would be the cortical spinal tract and it crosses over or is that? Okay. Yeah, that, that's definitely true to an extent, but let's, but let's think of it this way. All right, let me, I'm going to go back to my little drawing board here. It's 11, 11, make a wish. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I'll stop. Okay. Whiteboard. Let's go back. Okay. All right, guys, like I had a late night last night and got home late. And still not entirely with it, so give my sluggishness. All right, okay, central versus peripheral. I'm gonna draw a brain, woo. A little cord, woo, roots. No offense to people that say roots. All right, okay. And then, right, I've got my nerve roots here. One vertebrae, two vertebrae, three vertebrae. Okay, now here's the deal. Let's say, for example, okay, and I got Let's say, for example, that I have compression. Okay, I've got a big lesion or compression uh, at the spinal cord. Let's say, generally speaking, we'll say it's happening right here. There's my lesion, okay, right there, okay? So if that lesion is compressing the cord itself, all right? And, and because it is compressing the cord, change, changes not only the conduction velocity of the nerve, but the ability of the nerve to send messages, right? Not only sensory, but motor. Because of the way this is positioned anatomically, if everything below the side of compression is affected, all right, will that affect things on both sides or one side? If you look at the way that it's that it's set up. If it's being compressed in the middle. Both sides. What? Heard. Both Heard. sides. Yeah, who said both? Maddie? Maddie. Okay. All right, Maddie, you're correct. It will be it would be bilateral. Oh my god, look at that smile. You freaking crushed it. I love it. Okay. Yes. It's bilateral. Okay. Kylie so said that, not me. No, it's bilateral. So if you have some if you have something that's myelopathic, remember, okay, remember that if I have compression at the brain or the brain or spinal cord. Okay, remember, so the roots of the roots come off the spinal cord on both sides. Okay, so if I have compression, if I have compression of the cord above the level of a certain root, right, then every single message being relayed from my brain back down the cord below that point, right, is affected. Does that make sense? So as a result, as a result, these symptoms, because the nerve roots exit on both sides of the cord, will generally will generally occur bilaterally. Does that make sense? Where you're like, no, you lost me, Wade. I have no idea what you're actually saying right now. It makes sense. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. It makes sense. As opposed to, right, my, my radiculopathies. Okay, um, so with my radiculopathies, obviously, if I have a compression, right, and we already kind of talked about that, at a specific root, right, at a specific root on one side, all right, my symptoms then obviously would be unilateral. Is that, yeah, is that intuitive slash make sense? Okay, okay, very good. I love, nice, okay. All right. Okay, friends. Um, check it out. 
on Monday, we're going to start doing a little bit more. We're going to we're going to go over examination of transfers and gate. It's going to be the the bee's knees. I almost said something else, but it's going to be awesome. Okay, um, it's going to be it's going to be tons of fun. Um, so this lecture is up on Moodle, right? Don't forget that your discussion is due tonight if you have not already done so. Okay. Um, I like I like some of the stuff I'm seeing on the on the discussion board, so that's cool. Um, so yeah. Nice job, guys. Um, any questions before I say bye bye and go spend time with the sophomores? Okay. All right, friends. You guys are just so stinking great. I just love you. Okay. Um, I do. Look at this. Smiles on your head. Oh my gosh. Stop it. Just stop it. I cannot. Okay. All right, friends. Um, I will see you guys Monday. If you need anything, let me know. All right. And have a great, safe, and responsible weekend. All right. All right. I'll see you guys later. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Yep.